you guys would turn with me to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. If you do not know where that's at, that's the fourth book of the Bible. It's probably one you've avoided because it has a boring title. <laughs> Unless you love math. I avoided this book for a long time. But there's so many good things in here. It actually should be titled like The Wilderness Wandering or something better. As you guys are turning there, um, some of you know me, some of you don't. So for those that don't know me, I'm going to give a brief introduction to myself. Um, I've pretty much grown up at this church my whole entire life. I remember when this back right here used to be like an audience seating before they changed it into classrooms. I've gone through the kids' ministry, VBS, junior high, high school, young adults, um, and it's been a blessing to be part of this fellowship here. I've served under Dustin, uh, who does the high school ministry, for about six years, and then they asked me to take on junior high ministry, and I've been doing that for about eight and a half years. And being with the students, which they're all over here today, um, on Sundays and Wednesdays are like the highlight of my week because I have a passion for God's word and that they would understand it and know and grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so all that to say is like, I love this church. I love my pastor. I love being here with you guys. And just this place has had a massive impact on my life over the years. So I'm just blessed to be with all of you here. So you guys didn't come to hear my life story. You came to meet with the Lord through the teaching of God's word. So let's pray and dive into it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you right now. and We thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. We thank you that you never fail us, Lord. Even when we think you do, Lord, even when we think that you've let us down, Lord, or maybe you don't meet our certain expectations that we've placed on you, God, you shatter those expectations because you are so much greater. You are so much better. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us a fresh glimpse of who you are that would encourage our hearts, Lord, and lift us up if we're in that pit of despair, and that you would encourage us, that we would leave this room um, different and walk away different than when we came in, God. May you be glorified and honored. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in June of 2021, I had the privilege of going to share the gospel in New York City with Calvary Chapel, Marino Valley. And it was a powerful trip. I actually did it because I wasn't comfortable sharing the gospel. Teaching God's word behind the pulpit was my comfort zone. So I wanted to strengthen an area where I was weak in. And so I went out there with Calvary Chapel, Marino Valley, several friends of mine out there. And Wednesday morning, we had a free day. And so we were about to get on the subway cart. But God gave me this divine appointment with this young man named Brandon, as you guys can see here on the screen. His name, his name is Brandon, and he's about 16 years old back then on the subway. But the interesting thing about this is we were going to kind of visit one of the sites. And the subway cart pulled up in front of me. And as soon as I saw his face through that window there, I instantly had a burden for him. And I said, I have to talk to him. And it was the strangest thing. I've never experienced that before. But then I get into the subway cart, and all the seats are taken by him. And I was like, oh, great. So I sit like diagonal to him, and I'm praying. And that's something the that Lord taught me before starting a conversation about Jesus is to pray first. And so I was praying, and I was looking at my friend Burn, and I was like, God's putting him on his heart too as well. And so we prayed, and all of a sudden, the seats shift around, and I kind of sit across from him, and I kind of give my friend a head nod now. I was like, hey, start the conversation. And he comes up to him and goes, man, that sandwich smells so good. Where did you get it from? And he's like, oh, I got it by a place from my house, and shares the location. He's like, all right, cool. And then he just dips out of the conversation. And then I get to talk to him, and I got to share with him. And then all of a sudden, he asks me a question. He says, have you ever encountered a difficulty? And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, have you ever been depressed? And I don't know if you can see in that photo, he doesn't look very happy. And I was like, well, let me share my testimony with you. And I, had to share my, I got to share my testimony with this young man, not knowing that the whole subway cart was listening to our conversation. And I was able to give him a, a gospel track. Unfortunately, he did not accept the Lord on the spot. That's okay. But the Lord literally made the conversation stretch because we should have been at our stop a long time ago. And the Lord made us stop on the tracks like multiple times to stretch the conversation. And it was a blessing to encourage him. But I think about him when I think about discouraged people. 
And I believe just as the Lord placed a burden on my heart to talk to him, to encourage him who is discouraged, the Lord has placed a burden on my heart today, this evening, to talk to you in this room who are discouraged, who maybe feel alone, who are falling apart under life's pressure. And tonight, we're going to be looking at Moses and Moses' discouragement and how God actually responded to his discouragement. And I want to see through this story God's tenderness his graciousness, and how he responds to discouraged believers. Yet before we get into Numbers 11, I would like to read Isaiah 42, verse 3. In Isaiah 42, verse 3, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flask he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Now, when I first read that in Isaiah, I was like, what is this talking about? <laughs> And sometimes you might read something and you like read over and like, I have no idea what this means and you move on. But there's sometimes that the Lord kind of puts it on your heart like, hey, dive deeper. And as I dive deeper into this verse, I, I, I loved it and I fell in love with it because it's talking, it's a prophecy talking about Jesus Christ and what he would do basically. When it says a bruised reed, a bruised reed is a, or a reed is a fairly fragile plant, yet Jesus will handle that bruised plant with such gentleness that he will not break it. And the bruised actually speak of sinners, like the woman at the well in John 4, or the woman caught in adultery in John 8, or discouraged believers like Peter, who denied Jesus three times, or Moses, who was fed up, as we are going to look at in this point in Scripture. With each of these people, Jesus is gentle, careful, and tender in how he handles each one of them. And then he says, a smoking flask he will not quench. Now, the idea behind this is like embers that are almost just glowing in the fire that have no flame, no light, and they're about to go out. And sometimes we get to that point maybe in our own lives, in our own walks with the Lord, where we have no fire. All we're doing is producing smoke, yet the servant will not extinguish it. Instead, he will blow gently on that ember until it fans back into flames again. And so this verse here is speaking about how gentle our Lord is with discouraged people. So let's dive into the text. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, it says, Moses speaking, I am not able to bear all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. If I have found favor in your sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. Now, how did Moses, this man of God, get to this point in his life where he was fed up, where it's this breaking point where he's discouraged? See, discouragement, depression, even possibly suicide is not limited to a specific age or person. Moses here is about 81 years old at this time. And if you actually reflect back on his life and look at all the things that God did in his life, first, we see that Moses had an encounter with the Lord at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. After that, he got called into ministry, and God used him powerfully. He saw miracle after miracle that the Lord did, delivering the people from Egypt, and they got to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parted before their eyes and drowned the Egyptian army behind them, closing them off. Yet after they cross the Red Sea, they start complaining, the people. The first time they complain, they complain about not having enough to drink or anything to drink in Exodus 15. And so God makes bitter water sweet, performing a miracle. The second time they complain against Moses, it's not because they don't have anything to eat in Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. Therefore, God gave them bread from heaven, which is called manna, to eat. And we see a description of this in Numbers 11, verses 7 through 9. The third time they complain is when they don't have water. And in Exodus 17, verses 3 through 4, God provides water from a rock. Over and over, God is meeting their needs. Then they finally get down to Mount Sinai, which is at towards the bottom here on the map where they spend one full year there. And as they are there, Moses is on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights in his presence. 
And there God passes by him, and he, get a, he gets a glimpse of the glory of God. And during that year at Mount Sinai, God gives them the law and the instructions, everything they needed, and the instructions on how to build the tabernacle. And that's what they do. They build the tabernacle. And at the end of that one year, they finally pack up their bags, and the Lord says, all right, now the journey starts. The journey towards the promised land in Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 through 33. Now, I like to sometimes put myself in this story and imagine what characters are thinking here. I think Moses at this point, he's probably extremely hopeful. He's thinking we're on our way to the promised land that God has promised us. And he might have even thought things are going to get better from this point on. He goes, after all, we have the law. We have God's instructions. We have the tabernacle now. We have a pillar of fire leading us and a pillar of cloud. What can go wrong? Only three days into the journey. And the people start complaining for the fourth time. And this fourth and final time is overwhelming and the worst of all of them. See, there are two stages of the complaining here in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and the verses 4 through 6. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. It says, Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. So the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire was quenched. So, when, so he called the name of the place Turba. I, I butcher biblical names all the time, guys. Um, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. So here we see in verse 1, they start complaining and it displeases the Lord. Why? Why did it displease God? Well, because they were complaining about Moses' leadership and God's promises. In Psalms 27, verses um, sorry, uh, Psalms 78, verses 21 through 22, it says, Therefore the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. They were complaining because of a lack of trust and belief. And that's honestly the source of a lot of our complaints. So because we don't fully trust and depend upon the Lord. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says, do all things without complaining or disputing. Now, I personally don't like this verse because it's convicting every time I hear it. <laughs> to do all things without complaining. God doesn't like complainers. Now, in verses 4 through 6, we see the second complaint. And they complain about food, the manna, and they longed for Egypt to go back. Let's read verses 4 through 6. It says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yield to their intense cravings. So the children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish that we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and oh, the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now, I probably would be with the people complaining in this moment because I'm a person that likes variety. To eat this same thing every day for one year straight, that would be enough for me. I'm like, dude, give me some steak. I want some meat. And so the people are complaining here. They compare the food that they have to the food that they had back in Egypt. Comparing always leads to complaining. Comparing always leads to the complaining. And see, they compared the food that they had to the food that they once had back then. See, for those that maybe don't know, when studying the Bible, Egypt is basically a type of the world, the flesh, the old life going back to that, that God delivered them from and out of. They were longing for that old life. And sometimes that old life comes back up and we entertain those thoughts. 
We shouldn't be. And we are like the children of Israel in this point where we sometimes long for those things back in that day. And it says in verse 10 that everyone was at the tent, the door of their tent complaining. Can you guys imagine? I don't even know what it's like. Two million people complaining. I can't even imagine how that weighed upon Moses as the leader. It's probably overwhelming. See, nothing good whatsoever comes from complaining. Complaining actually makes us overwhelmed personally. In Psalm 77, verse 3, this, uh, the writer Asaph, he said, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. That's what happens. When we get overwhelmed, it's because we're sometimes complaining. We think the grass is greener on the other side when it's really not. And what we need is to kind of change our perspective. See, complaining only produces more complaining. The people complained, which led to Moses complaining. Now, in verses 10 through 13, Moses complains about God and the people. Look at this. It says, verse 10, Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you inflicted your servants? And why have I not found favor in your sight? that you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? That means, did he give birth to them? That, I should say, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they were weeping all around me, saying, give meat, give us meat that we may eat. There's seven things I want to point out about Moses and his discouragement. First, number one is Moses is displeased. And I really greatly admire this kind of, because the thing that displeased the Lord displeased Moses. But Moses here, he's overtaxed, he's stressed, he's drained both physically and emotionally, he's strained and probably exhausted. Now, Traveling and going on vacation can be very stressful at times, right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> I think that's a lot of us, right? You plan a vacation and then you start packing. And with a fam my, my size family, some of us would kind of be playing when we were younger kids and others would be helping and some wouldn't be helping. Even traveling to different countries with uh, Dustin and the high school ministry. Um, it's always stressful getting to the location. But once you get to the location, you can relax, you can calm down, and things are good. There was one time we were coming back from Costa Rica in 2012. We had a layover in Texas, and we had to go through customs. But going through customs put us back. And so as soon as I got through customs, Dustin says, Josh, run ahead, see if they'll stop the plane. So I'm running through the airport. I jump on a, tr uh, uh, a train to another location, and they close the door. And there's like 20-something of us that get left behind. And we had to spend the night in the airport, which made a fun memory. But it's exhausting traveling, right? And can you imagine getting 20, uh, 2 million people packed up and moving them constantly and then unpacking and then packing again and moving again? This was a lot of stress. The second thing I want to point out is Moses blamed God. Verse 11 says, why have you inflicted your servant? It's almost as if he's like pointing a finger at the Lord. God, you did this to me. You're the one that called me to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. He's blaming the Lord. The third thing we see is Moses doubts God's goodness. Also in verse 11, he says, why have I not found favor in your sight? Why have I not found favor in your sight? Why haven't you been good to me, God? God has been good to him, but not in the way that Moses wanted him to be. Point number four, Moses complained about the people. You have laid the burden of all these people on me. In verses 14 and 15, it goes on to say, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now if I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. The fifth thing is Moses felt alone. 
He says, I'm not able to bear all these people alone. Pastor David has even said, the higher you go up in ministry sometimes, the more lonely it feels. And nobody can really relate to Moses here. Not many people can understand the pressures that he went through. And sometimes that feeling of loneliness can be so consuming. And you can even feel lonely in a, in a room crowded with people. And you can feel by yourself at times. See, the enemy wants us to feel alone. He wants to isolate us. Because when he can isolate us, that's when he can whisper into our hearts lies. It says in Proverbs 18, verse 1, that a man who isolates himself rages against all wise judgment. We're not called to isolate ourselves. God has not called us to be alone. We're called to be in fellowship. And he has companions he wants to bring alongside of us. Six, the burden was too great for Moses. He said, the burden is too heavy for me. He was collapsing under this amount of pressure. Now, I think there's different burdens in life. There are good burdens and then there's our bad burdens. I think the good burdens can stretch us. And the bad burdens is those burdens that God wants to break and destroy. Those bad burdens can be sin or guilt that have been weighing us down that God wants to free us from. Maybe possibly unrealistic expectations we place on ourselves or on others. The burdens in life increase over time. They grow. And the seventh thing is Moses' selfish request. He prays to die. Please kill me here and now. Moses is so discouraged, and it's possibly even because he came off of a high, high, He's seen the backside of the Lord. He got a glimpse of God. God has done all these things. And it's sometimes after a camp, after God's done something incredible, that the low lows come in. Even we see that with the life of Elijah. Elijah, he, he's one of my favorite prophets in Scripture. He has this God battle. He's like, you're God against my God. And they're like, all right, let's do this. And so they call out all day and all night. Nothing happens. And then Elijah soaks the altar and prays, and fire comes down, consuming the stone itself. He takes the sword out and slaughters all 450 evil prophets of Baal. But then, after that massive victory, one woman, Jezebel, threatened him, and he went off running. Moses here makes a selfish request. J. Oswald Sanders said in his book, Spiritual Clinic, the desire to die stems from making self and self-interest supreme instead of God and his glory. Is not all depression, in a sense, a manifestation of self in one form or another? I agree with that. Moses was wallowing in his self-pity here. Sanders goes on to say, if we shift our center from God to self, for even a period of time, we lay ourselves open to the sickness of this spirit of discouragement or depression. Oswald Chambers, a different author, said, self-awareness is the first thing that will upset our completeness of our life in God. Self-awareness continually produces a sense of strain and turmoil in our lives. I think we need to become more Christ-aware than self-aware. And become more Christ-centered than self-centered. Warren Wearsby, he said, self-centered praying killed Moses' faith. See, Moses here is discouraged. He's depressed, possibly suicidal. He's just consumed with self, deeply disappointed. Maybe he even felt a sense of failure. But how does God respond to all of this? We see God's response in verses 16 through 23. And his response is one of gentleness. Verses 16 and 17, it says, So the Lord answered Moses, Gather to me 70 men of Israel, uh, elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and uh, offices of them. 
Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take the spirit that is upon you, and I will put it, put the same upon them, that they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. A couple of things I want to point out how God responds. The first thing is how God does not respond in the text. God doesn't get upset. He doesn't get angry with Moses here for how he's talking to him. God could have said, hey, don't talk to me like that. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, come on, man, you shouldn't be discouraged. Man up. No, I believe Moses here is beginning to see God's mercy and grace. In Exodus chapter 34, verses, verse 6, it says, The Lord passed before him, proclaiming, or proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Moses is starting to experience this truth in his life, personally at this moment. Also, God did not address every question that Moses asked and verbalized. He says, why have you inflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight? God just completely ignores these questions. And I thought to myself, what if God doesn't answer all of our questions? How would we respond? What if God only answers some of our questions in this life? Or not even all of them. How are we going to respond to the Lord? Are we going to continue to follow him? Are we going to continue to trust him? See, God doesn't have to answer our questions. If he chooses to, that's his mercy and his grace in our lives. We are not to make demands of God. God is the one making demands of us. I love what Warren Wearsby said. I've said this before. And to me, it's powerful. He said, Christians do not live off of explanations, but off the promises of God. And too often, we are asking the why, and we want the explanation. When God says, here, I have a promise instead, and he gives us a promise. I think of the lyrics from the song, Mercy Me, where it goes, uh, the song's called Even If, and it goes like this. I'm not going to sing it for you guys. <laughs> it goes, I know you're able I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. I know the sorrow, I know the hurt will all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. Those are some powerful lyrics. Also, God does not answer Moses' selfish request to die. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm thankful that God has not answered some of my prayer requests, aren't you? I'm thankful, like, God, thank you that you did not say yes to that or that. And so notice the second thing God does. God listens to Moses. God already knew everything he was going to say. He could have said, come on, let's speed this up. But he stops, listens. He doesn't interrupt Moses. He allows him to speak. As our heavenly father, he listens patiently to his words and the heart behind his words as well. It just reminds me that God has an open ear to us. He's in tune to his child's voice and they're calling out to him. After all, prayer is not based on performance. It's based off of relationship. Because when Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said, pray this way, our father that is in heaven. It's a relationship that we have that prayer is based off of. Jeremiah 29, verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. God says, I'm going to listen to you. I'll listen to your problems. I'll listen to what's going on. And we need people like that in our lives, right? Not only the Lord listening to us, but others that will give a listening ear that we can share our hearts and our feelings with and direct us back to the Lord. The third thing is God answers Moses. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Now, we serve a God that answers us. However, it may not be in the way we want, and it might not be in the timing we want either, but he's faithful to answer us. I was meeting up with a friend, um, and we had some lunch the other day, and he serves in ministry at a different church, and he was just sharing all that God was doing in his life. 
And he was kind of talking about like this previous season he was in. He was praying, he was crying out to the Lord, um, just trying to get direction from the Lord. And it seemed kind of quiet from God. And he was like, he said, I, I was on my face, I was on my knees, constantly be- to the Lord, before the Lord, crying out. And it just seemed like God didn't respond. Until him and his family went on vacation somewhere and he had a job to do on vacation. And he's kind of like an electrician handyman. And this job, he actually had to go down to the basement and kind of hook some wires together. And as, he, as he's down in the basement by himself, hooking some wires together in the middle of like somewhere, all of a sudden, God just speaks to him there. God might not speak to you in the timing that we want, but he's faithful to speak. And it wasn't the message he was, gonna, he was thinking of getting. And he goes, really, God, is that you? And it was sure enough, God, he goes, I'll show you one step, and you've got to be obedient with that one step, and then I'll show you the next step, and then I'll show you the next step. God's faithful to answer. Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty or inaccessible things which you do not know. Fourth, God met Moses' needs, meets Moses' needs, and eases his burden. He says in verses 16 and 17, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, and I will take the spirit that is upon you, and will put that same spirit upon them that they may bear the burden of the people with you together. I love this because God gives a practical solution. He says, hey, grab 70 guys that you are, can be trusted, that you know are elders, that are wise. And he goes, they're going to bear the burden with you so that you don't have to bear it alone. He goes, I'm going to take that spirit that's upon you and put it upon them so they can help carry that load. And we see this take place in verses 24 through 30. The elders are gathered. The Holy Spirit comes and empowers them and equips them. And I love this because I believe the Lord wants to uh, help ease our burdens. But we first got to bring it to the Lord, first and foremost, as Moses did here. He shared his frustrations to the Lord. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast your burdens on the Lord. He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I want to stop and focus on this verse for a little while. I love this verse because I think it's probably ministered to several of us in this room before. But I love when God takes a verse and sheds new light on it. I was going through a book by this author, Guy King, and he highlighted this verse. And he says, sometimes when we isolate our need and we take it out of the text and we get so fixated on our need, it becomes overwhelming and consuming. But we forget what it's placed between. And it's almost like three picture frames. The need is at the middle, but the beginning is my God. And when you place my God and then Jesus Christ, his riches between your need, those two make your need small because Jesus is rich in mercy, compassion, gracious, merciful. You can see in um, Romans and Ephesians all the things that Jesus is rich in and he desires to meet our needs. Matthew chapter 11, verses 38 through uh, 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is expressing his heart here. He says, I am gentle and I am lowly in heart, and I desire to give you rest. And I love this because God is giving us an invitation. He's constantly giving us invitations, saying, hey, come to me, and I will relieve you. And it was cool because I actually shared this at one of the Christian clubs in the school districts uh, at Ramona Junior High, kind of just this idea of, like, what's the difference between, like, a need and a want? And so all the students talk about, oh, you need oxygen, you have, you need food, you need shelter, and they list all these different needs. And I was like, all right, those are fantastic Now, does God have any needs? And they think, they're like, oh yeah, God needs us. And then all of a sudden I say, no, God doesn't need you. 
and you actually could feel like the life gets sucked out of the room. And they're just like, oh. And they, literally all their heads went down. But I said, God doesn't need you, but he wants you. And what's better, to be needed or wanted? God wants you. That's why he extends an invitation to you and says, come. I want you to be a part. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to go to heaven. But how we respond to that invitation matters and determines the course of eternity for us, whether we receive it by faith and believe it or we reject it and say no. See, God wants to bring people into our lives to help us carry these burdens, just like God did with Moses here. God has, at this moment, people around you to help with the pressures and the burdens that you are facing. But sometimes I think we are too prideful to ask for help, right? <laughs> and say, hey, would you guys help me with this? Or reach out for, to a brother or a sister and say, hey, can you pray for me? Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. Sorry, chapter 6, verse 2. If you haven't noticed, I'm dyslexic. Sometimes I switch the numbers around. It says, bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Help each other out. Then in verses 18 through 23, we see some more information. It says, verse 18, Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourself for tomorrow, um, tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it is... For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat meat, not for one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but you for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils. I love that. And becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come out of Egypt? Verse 21, And Moses said, The people whom I am among are 600,000 men on foot. That's not including women and children. Yet you have said, You will give me, give them meat, and they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to uh, provide enough for them? And I love God's response. And the Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. The fifth thing is God reveals his power to Moses. In verse 23, he says, the Lord said to him, to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? That's such an interesting phrase. What does that even mean? Anytime we see the arm of the Lord in Scripture, it's referring to the power of God. So anytime you see that reference, it's always pointing back and talking about the power of God. Not that God's arm, physical arm is shortened, because God doesn't have a physical body but it's using this illustration. Basically, he's asking this question, is the Lord's power limited? Is God's power limited? Has God suddenly become weak, or is he handicapped? No. When I think of this verse and God asking this question, there's a movie that pops into my mind, and it's Meet the Robinsons. Have you guys seen this movie? Or the dinosaurs chasing the kid. And he says, I have a big head and little arms, and he can't get the kid. I picture God saying, do I have short arms? Am I like a T-Rex? Am I a handicap? And the thing is, like, no. God is not limited in his power or his capacity. God has resources that Moses knew nothing about. We might say that God likes to meet our needs in completely unexpected ways. We see that throughout Scripture. Isaiah 50, verse 2, it says, my, Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Isaiah 59, verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. I love this. 
because God's hand is reaching out. And when people are kind of stuck in that pit of despair, I think of Jeremiah when they threw him into the dungeon and he sunk into the mire. Sometimes you feel like you're stuck in that discouragement. You're stuck in that mindset. The Lord's hand is outreached and he can reach into the deepest parts and pull people out of that mindset, out of that despair, out of that discouragement. See, God's, God is unlimited in his capacity and he's ready to save and deliver. But Chuck Smith said this, there is no problem with God. He can do it. The problem always lies on our side. And that is true. There's never a problem with God. God is always perfect, always great, always good. The problem is us. So what is our problem then? Are we focusing on ourselves? Are we becoming isolated? Or do we have our eyes fixed on the Lord? Like Isaiah 26 verse 3, he says, those who keep their minds on the Lord, he will keep them in perfect peace. And so God speaks this to Moses. And in verses 31 through 35, actually God sends the quail. And they have quail and it's just floating above the ground. And for the next 36 hours, they collect quail. And it says, while the meat was still between their teeth, as they were chewing on it and digesting it, God struck them with a great plague. And the name of that place was called Graves of Craving because they yield to their sinful desire. They yield to that. The last point I want to share with you is point number six. God's response is tailored specific to each individual, depending on what your situation, who you are, and what you are going through. And I love this, because as I've been studying the Bible, I've seen this over and over in Scripture. When Elijah heard, read that kind of request or that um, letter from Jezebel, and he took off running, there's six things that he did that we shouldn't do. He listened to fear. He didn't pray. He pushed people out of his life. He compared himself to his fathers. And he says, God, kill me. And the way God responds to him is so gentle. He sends him an angel. An angel kind of touches him and allows him to sleep. He takes two naps, basically. The angel cooks some meals, allows him to eat. And then God doesn't even say anything yet. And the, the angel says, you've got to go on this journey. And he goes on this journey for, I think it's 40 days and 40 nights. And still God doesn't say anything yet until he's at this mountain and God speaks to him. Or you have Jonah and God speaks to him differently. Or Peter. God's response to those that are discouraged is tailored. It's different. It's specific. We fast forward. At the end of Moses' life when he's writing Deuteronomy, He's probably about 120 years old. In Deuteronomy chapter uh, 3, verse 24, he says, O Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. I like this verse. He goes on to actually ask the Lord, hey, can I go in the promised land? And God says, no, don't talk to me about this again. <laughs> and then he finally says, all right. He goes, okay, I'll let you go. But I like this part of the verse because he goes, You've only, I've only begun to see you. After 120 years of walking, with, uh, seeing God's hand, 40 years in the wilderness, he has only begun to see how great and glorious and merciful and kind and gentle God is. And his mighty hand. And just as God was gentle with Moses, who was discouraged, he's gentle with you and I as well. I love it because... I was reading in, in that same book by Guy King, and he says, you know what? God will never belittle your problems, but he will also never make your problems bigger than what they are. He will treat them as the, as the way you see them. And I love that about God. He's so good and he's so kind. Isaiah, I want to return back to the, the first verse I read. In Isaiah 42, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not quench. Sorry, a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flask he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Alan Redpath, he said this. 
We call ourselves Christians. But if you are like me, sometimes you are desperately ashamed of how dim your light burns. There are, four, there are far more smoke than fire. So little prayer, so little real testimony, so much depression and discouragement. But the Lord says he will not extinguish the smoking flask. So if you've come in here tonight and you feel discouraged, you feel worn out, you feel like all you have left is embers, the Lord will not extinguish that. He will breathe on that slowly and take that small embers and make a uh, flame out of that once again, shining bright for the Lord. That is just how gentle and gracious God is when he deals with us. He takes the bruised and the broken and he heals them and brings them back to health. And he breathes on that smoking ember. I want to read one last quote to you guys. And this quote, I heard it a long time ago, but it's ministered to me constantly. And I go back and read it every once in a while. And it's by this lady, Annie Johnson Flint. And she had a lot of infirmities in her own life and trials that she went through. But she wrote this amazing piece And this is what she says, and it's actually titled, He Giveth More Grace. So she said, He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our laborers increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we've exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed and either the day is half done, When we have reached the end of our harbored resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. Fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on the arm everlasting, availing. The Father both thee and thy load to bear. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power is boundless, unknown to man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Our God is a giver, and he wants to restore, help us out. And so don't feel bad for going to him with the same issue over and over. He says, come. He wants to help. He wants to heal. He wants to lift you back up and set your feet on that solid rock and bring you back to that place of security, safety, and peace.